All right. Hey, Glen Baptist Church, welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, obviously, we're not able to meet in person because we have uh, made a decision here at Glen Baptist Church that the safest thing to do right now with this COVID spike going on is to uh, try and eliminate as many connection points as we as we can. And so we have done that by um, uh, cutting back on our Wednesday night programs. And so we've canceled that for the month of August. We've also uh, decided to cancel Sunday school, nursery, children's church, uh, those kinds of small group meeting uh, meetings like that. Uh, and we are reducing and simplifying our ministries right now in person at least to uh, the Sunday morning worship hour, uh, which begins at 1030 on Sunday mornings. You are welcome to come and be in attendance Sunday morning at 1030. Would love to have you if you are healthy. If you're not healthy, not feeling well, feeling any symptoms at all of sickness, we're going to ask you to stay at home and uh, join us online where we will be streaming uh, through Facebook Live and our uh, our app and our website, glenbaptistchurch.org, um, and then also, of course, our YouTube uh, channel. So those are going to be available to you. And in an attempt also to make this accessible to you, uh, we are going to be streaming uh, this on Facebook and as well uh, our YouTube channel, hopefully that's working correctly and you can get it on YouTube. Um, we've been testing some things out today to make sure it's all working properly and we think that it is. And so um, that's that's what we're hoping happens. Uh, so hopefully you can, you can get this. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I do want to address uh, just something here at the very beginning because it's just a real burden on my heart, obviously with COVID going on. We're, we are praying for multiple families in our church that are dealing with COVID right now. Uh, with some are in and out of the hospital, struggling with getting their oxygen levels up and not being able to maintain those uh, needed oxygen levels. Others struggling uh, in various ways with COVID. And uh, so we're definitely praying for them. Um, we've got others in our church family that are struggling with COVID, but not too bad and, and are just needing to stay home. And we're thankful that so far um, their symptoms aren't any worse and we're praying that that stays that way. Um, but what one of the things that's going on right now, and this is just, you know, uh, me, like we need to be unified. Like we don't need to, um, let me put it this way. The enemy is looking to kill, steal, and destroy. And he is looking to tear down the church any way he can. Um, and one of the ways I believe the enemy is using COVID, I think obviously the enemy is using COVID uh, in a lot of different ways in our society, in our nation, in our community, in our church, and all kinds of things. Um, one way, obviously, is to try and get the church to not meet, uh, which Satan rejoices when the church can't meet, gather together. Um, but I think another way more insidious that he is using COVID and is making uh, COVID a real danger to the church um, and, and just to be clear, the Church of Jesus Christ will have victory, so it's not like Satan's going to win. But one thing he's trying to do to try and disrupt the church and, and, and kill, steal, and destroy within the church is he is wanting to use COVID as a de-unifying uh, thing. He is wanting to get the church distracted and off mission, and we can't let him do that, okay? And so... Uh, we need to stay focused on the gospel, what really matters, and that is that Jesus Christ loves you and he came to die on the cross for your sins and rise from the dead so that if you would repent and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, you can be saved and you can be brought into the family of God, be brought into the church uh, through, through baptism, brought into that community of faith and uh, rejoice and celebrate in the salvation that he has given all of us. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. Uh, Jesus Christ is what we celebrate as the church. What the enemy is trying to do is use COVID to distract and divide, and we can't let him do that. Now, here's the thing. Like, I'm just, I'm being, I'm past a lot of this. I'm just kind of over it in a lot of different ways. One of the ways I'm over it is I am just, I've just come to the conclusion, I'm going to speak bluntly to you. I've tried to, to not speak clearly about some things in the past just because of I didn't want disunity and I didn't want to divide. And I thought, no, you know what? That's probably not setting a good model. And so uh, just taking a moment here uh, to just do what I've been doing more of lately, and that is just be blunt and model what I think Christian conversation should look like in church. So here's the deal. 
Um, I've been vaccinated. My family's been vaccinated. We believe vaccination is a good thing for us and, and our family. Uh, I believe that that is an individual decision, that every family should come to those decisions themselves, look at the facts, and, um, and make that decision on, on what they do. But here, here's the thing. Whether you believe you should vaccinate or you believe you shouldn't vaccinate, here, here, here's what's important, that we don't demonize another brother or sister in Christ who has a different viewpoint than we have. Um, if you decide not to vaccinate, for whatever reason, you've got a list of reasons why you think it's better for you to not vaccinate, you are not going to hear me say, how dare you, um, or you're being unfaithful, or uh, anything like that. You're, you're, you're sinning against God for not taking this vaccine. I, I, I would never say that. I, I commend you for your diligence, your own research, and your coming to your own decision on whether or not you should take the vaccine. Uh, and and I, I, I affirm that in whatever decision you make. Um, and, and all I'm asking or expecting is that you do the same. If you come to that conclusion, you do the same to the people who decide that they do need to vaccinate. Um, there's plenty of evidence and studies and things that suggest that vaccination is a good thing. And it's something that everybody should do. And, um, and so I believe that. We, we held a vaccination site at our church to help make it easier for people to get vaccinated because we believe um, that, it's, that it's a safe thing and a God-honoring thing to do. Um, but I am disturbed by an increasing um, hostility on both sides people that are vaccinated against people that are not vaccinated or people that are not vaccinated against people that are vaccinated as if it is a moral obligation to do either. It's not. You are a good, faithful Christian or can be. You can be a good, faithful Christian being vaccinated or not vaccinated. You can trust the Lord being vaccinated or not being vaccinated. Um, what's important is that you do your own research. You do your own study you do your own prayers. You stand before the Lord yourself on your own. We believe in the priesthood of the believer. You answer to God. You don't have a priest. I'm not a priest to you. You're your own priest before the Lord. You have your own high priest, Jesus Christ. You go to him directly. And you work it out for yourself. Um, and you come to your own conclusion. But whatever that conclusion is, to vaccinate or not vaccinate, that is the question. Um, we need to treat each other with love and respect, right? Right? Um, we, we will not allow Satan to uh, disrupt and destroy and to even imply uh, that another believer, another person in Christ is being unfaithful simply because of their decision to vaccinate or not, not vaccinate is, is just um, not acceptable. So uh, be loving towards one another. Be generous towards one another. Be long-suffering towards one another. Um, be respectful towards one another and understand that Christians are going to come to different viewpoints. Okay. And so I say that to just simply say, I'm vaccinated. I believe vaccination is a good thing. Um, you are not clearly being unfaithful to God or his word or being untrusting by taking the vaccination any more than you are being untrusting to, uh, to God by taking Tylenol when you're headache. Like I, like it's ridiculous, right? To say, Oh, if you take a Tylenol when you have a headache, you're not trusting God to cure you of that headache. No, that's God in his providence has given us medicines and vaccines to help us. We wouldn't tell a cancer patient, um, how dare you take chemo uh, for, for, for uh, the cancer. You should trust God to take care of the cancer. No, God usually, usually, the usual pattern of how God works, God typically works through the natural means that he has given us giftedness to think, understand, do science, uncover, uh, make discoveries, make medicines, develop uh, science, scientific and medical technologies that help us. That is the providence of God in society. That's how he heals people usually. He typically heals cancer patients of cancer through chemo. He doesn't typically heal them by just miraculous work, although he can and does. He does it normally, right? And so the normal faithful Christian is fine and, in, and is trusting God in taking the chemo. Now, they don't have to take the chemo. They're certainly within their right to, to, to not take the chemo and to trust the Lord. And they are being absolutely fine in doing that. You won't hear me criticize you for doing that. But 
but I'm not going to criticize people who do take the chemo. And likewise, and, and you're, you, you shouldn't criticize someone who decides to take the chemo. And likewise, we don't criticize people who take, decide to take Tylenol for headaches. We don't criticize people who decide to take chemo for cancer. We don't criticize people who decide to get a flu vaccine. Like, nobody's up in arms about the flu vaccine every year when half the church decides to get flu vaccines. And no one gets upset about people in church every year that decide not to get flu vaccines. It, simmer down, right? Calm down. Everybody has a right to decide. Thankfully, we live in America, and we do have a right to decide. And maybe you're in a situation that's a totally different thing right now, and I'm praying for you. If you're in a situation where an employer is mandating that you do something that you that goes against your conscience and you don't want to do. I'm praying for you as you wrestle through those kinds of issues because I know like we have people in our church who are in this category of they feel like they shouldn't get the vaccine and yet their employer like Baptist Health or uh, the United States government or uh, some somebody else uh, is requiring their employees to get the vaccine and they don't want to or they feel like that's um, they shouldn't. But I want to make this very clear as well. Um, you should not be refraining to get the vaccine based upon deeply held religious beliefs. Because there's not a deeply held religious belief that would keep you from getting the vaccine. It's a medical choice that you're making to not get the vaccine, not a deeply held religious belief. And because, And the reason I make that point is because faithful Christians can take the vaccine. That, that's, that's all I'm trying to say. And, and, and if I'm hammering this too hard, it's just because I, I confess to you, I'm getting tired, I'm getting tired of the political, the, um, the accusations, the spiritual um, attacks that I'm seeing from Christians against other Christians who are either for or against the vaccine uh, based upon whatever. Just just love God and love your neighbor as yourself, okay? In every decision you make and in how you talk about it. And I wanna, I'm gonna make this one last point and then I'm gonna move on to the Bible study. It doesn't matter if you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, but it matters in how you talk about it. Now, and I'm not, don't hear me say it's wrong for Christians to debate it. Christians can debate it. You, you can debate it all you want. I'm kind of over it. I'm over the debate. I've, I've got my settled what I believe. I, I'm not interested in debating it much more. Okay, uh, I'll have the conversation with you if you want to, but I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in debates anymore. Okay, um, But the debate is not the problem. The argument is not the problem. Argue your points with somebody who wants to argue with you about your points. But the way in which you argue the points is what's important. Make sure that as you talk about this, whether it's with family members or neighbors or coworkers or whatever you're doing, you represent Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ. So as you talk about vaccines or whatever, masks or whatever, as you talk about it, make as you debate it, as you argue about it even, I'll use the word argue, make sure that you do so you do such with a Christ-like, loving, merciful, gracious attitude. Make sure that you are presenting facts, not emotions. Make sure you're presenting uh, information, not attitudes. And make sure that you're not implying sin or nefarious intentions upon someone else simply because they've arrived at a different conclusion. In other words, apply the golden rule to people when you talk to them about, about this and they disagree with you. Um, treat them as you want to be treated. Okay, um, And that means lovingly, graciously, assuming the best about them. Um, assume that when somebody says, I'm getting vaccinated or I'm not getting vaccinated, assume that it's because they believe in Christ because they trust Christ, because they've been thoughtful about it, because they've prayed and fasted over it. And that's the conclusion that they've come to genuinely and honestly in faithfulness to Christ and treat them as such as you argue and debate it, if you so choose to argue and debate it. All right. That was probably completely unhelpful to you in any way. 
but if it is, I hope it is. All right. Now we're going into our Wednesday. Night. That's just me as your pastor, just wanting to unload and take this opportunity to share that. All right. Now on to our Bible study. We've been walking through on Wednesday nights Bible study about sin. All right. And we've been talking about different aspects of sin. So last week or two weeks ago, when we did our Bible study, we talked specifically about how there are different levels to sin. Some sins are worse than other sins in one way. And then in another way, we talked about how all sin is equal and that if you've broken one sin, you've broken them all and you're guilty of breaking them all. And so uh, that was kind of a fun conversation about sin. What we're talking about t today is answering this question about sin. And this will probably wrap up our very long uh, series on sin. And that is answering this question. What happens when a Christian sins? What, hap excuse me, what happens when a Christian sins? All right, the reason I'm asking that question, the reason why we're framing our discussion and our study around that question is because of this. We understand when we typically talk about sin and what happens when somebody sins, we typically talk about it in terms of like lostness. Like we talk about, well, your sin has separated you from God. Your sin has, uh, you've sinned and therefore you're lost and you need to be saved. Because of your sin, it's sending you to hell. You know, those kinds of ways is where we often think of the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death, right? And so that's typically how we talk about sin. But for the Christian, for somebody who is saved, who has a relationship with Christ, who is a believer, um, that's an incomplete conversation because when I sin, and I do sin often, when I sin, um, I'm still saved. Like it has not separated me from God in the sense that uh, I no longer have a relationship with him. Um, I'm still his child. I'm still forgiven. I'm still saved. I'm still going to heaven. That hasn't changed. And so the question is precisely, why should I care about sin in my life if... If when I sin, it doesn't separate me from God. It doesn't cause me to lose my salvation. And by the way, that's an underpinning theological uh, bedrock of this conversation is the understanding that you can't lose your salvation. Um, now, again, we've talked about this previously recently, and that is that doesn't mean that just because you're saved means you're saved. You can think you're saved and not be saved and be surprised when you don't go to heaven when you die uh, because um, you're, there's no atonement for your sin. But for those of us who are truly saved, those of us who, who did give our lives to Christ, who did repent of our sins and trust in him, well, what happens when we sin? Because every single one of us are in this category because ev there's no such thing as a perfect Christian. Every single one of us have sinned. That's true before Christ, but it's also true after Christ. There is not one person who is perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Paul sinned after he got saved. I'm not talking before. I'm talking after. After. Paul himself admits it. He's chief of sinners, present tense. He considers himself to be a great, gross sinner. Peter sinned. You know, Go down the list. All, all the disciples sinned. Um, everybody post-conversion as a child of God sins. So what does it mean to us when we sin? That's what we're talking about. What happens when a Christian sins? So I want to first lay out this very important principle, and this is found in Romans 8.1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans 8.1, and it says, um, I've got my Bible on my screen here, so I'll be looking at that. In Romans 8.1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a glorious verse this is. This this verse, man, like when you start to really unpack this verse and understand the significance of this verse, it is gloriously wonderful. There is now, therefore, no condemnation. So there is now, therefore, a little condemnation. There is now, therefore, a smidgen of 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 conversation of of uh, condemnation. Nope. There is now and therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. Well, what if I've done this? Or what if I've done that? No condemnation. No condemnation. 
That's when Jesus looks at you, he, no condemnation. You are perfect legally in his sight. Legally perfect, no condemnation. What a glorious truth. What does that mean? It, this means you have the wonderful, wonderful gift of what we call permanent justification. What is justification? Justification is just as if I'd never sinned. That though you are a sinner, Christ looks at you and justifies you. He says you are righteous, ju just as righteous as if you had never committed any sins. Well, what if, what if I committed ten, 10 sins today? Well, Jesus is going to treat you just as if you'd never sinned any of them, right? Permanent justification. And the glorious thing about permanent justification is that it's permanent. That means it isn't going anywhere. You can't lose it. You're justified perfectly today, tomorrow, and forever. Permanent justification. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Glorious, wonderful truth. All right. So, here's the problem, though. When you sin, something does happen. Even though there's no condemnation from a legal perspective, God's not going to say, oh, you sinned one too many times. Now you have to go to hell, even though you got saved when you were 10 years old. You sinned one too many times that one day or throughout the rest of your life, and so therefore there's going to be some condemnation. Nope, no condemnation if you're in Christ. But something does happen when you sin as a Christian. What is that? All right, so let's look at uh, some of these passages because we want to acknowledge there is some spiritual damage that sin causes. Sin does cause spiritual damage to a believer. The first place I want to go is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. All right. Ephesians 4, 30. All right. Here's what it says. Uh, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and back up and read this whole thing because honestly, this kind of highlights what I was saying earlier at the start of this about the whole COVID vaccination thing. I just want to read this because I think this will be edifying devotionally to us, kind of outside the scope of our immediate Bible study. Here's what it says, starting in verse 25, Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only speech that is good for building up as fits the occasion so that it may give grace to those who hear. So to apply this specifically to our earlier conversation, whenever you say something about vaccines, pro against, arguing with somebody about it, make sure that whatever you say, only say things that are good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may be that it may give grace to those who hear. And then it says this in verse 30, if you don't do that, you're sinning, right? If you don't listen to what I said at the start of this video, you're sinning. Because here's what it says in verse 30. If you don't speak in such a way that builds up and is no corrupting talk, but gives grace to those who hear. If you don't do that, here's what it says in verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. All right, this is awesome. This verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God through that ungraceful talk the talk that doesn't build one another up. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by, obviously, if you do that, that's sinning, and that grieves the Holy Spirit because you're sinning in that way, right? Because you're a tool of the thief, right? It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Two important things about this verse. One, sin in a believer's life causes the Holy Spirit of God to be grieved. Causes him to be grieved. Now, this is kind of an interesting word here. This word grief, um, I'm I'm pulling it up uh, in my in my in my uh, Bible app here. 
uh, it says grief means um, it, it means to change one's mind about to change one's mind about what an interesting word usage right in other words it's almost as if when you sin the Holy Spirit is grieved it means he changes his mind about you now what does that mean well it's not that he changes his mind eternally about you because of something the second point that we're gonna say here in just a moment but in other words what it does is it makes God disappointed it makes him disappointed even though you're a child of God even though you're in front and quite frankly you could look at it this way because you're a child of God because you're in his family He's grieved. He he looks at you differently than he should because you're his child. And he's disappointed. That's what it means. So instead of God being overjoyed with you, sin causes him to be grieved over you. Now, here's the good news, right? That's part of this idea of eternal security and why this is so awesome, this idea of a permanent justification. And that is the second part of the, the verse here. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul goes out of his way to make the point here in this passage that even when you grieve the Holy Spirit, even when you cause the Holy Spirit to change his mind about you, that's a strong word, even when you cause the Holy Spirit to change his mind about you because of your sin, you're still sealed. Who is the seal that, that Paul himself, Paul himself uses this word seal earlier in, in Ephesians, talking about the Holy Spirit is our seal for salvation. God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, right? We can't lose our salvation. We are sealed and protected by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, even when God feels differently about you because of your sin, it still doesn't affect your salvation. You can't lose your salvation, right? But, but it does grieve him. It does cause him to feel and think differently about you because of your sin. It grieves him, okay? But not to the point that it causes him to say, okay, never mind, I'm not going to forgive him. Okay, never mind, I'm not going to love him anymore. No, it's the same way that we see a father towards a child. And we're going to talk about that in, in a little bit later as we as we describe more about this, okay? So that's Ephesians 4.30. Uh, when you sin as a Christian... It doesn't cause you to lose your salvation, does not cause you to lose your salvation. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit, but you make that Holy Spirit that has sealed you grieve. Grieve. All right. Secondly, uh, what do we see? We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. All right. So, because you are sons of God, if you're saved, and this is just another like little nitpicky like you know annoyance that I have in general when I hear people say we're all children of God. No, we're not all children of God. The only people that are children of God are the people who are saved. Um, if you're not saved, you're a child of Satan. But if you're saved, you're a child of God. And because you're a child of God, God treats you differently when you sin. He does not discipline those who are not his children. But those who are his children, when they sin, he disciplines. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. The Lord, or I'll start back in verse 5 right before it. It says, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't treat it cavalierly. Oh, it doesn't matter that I sinned and because I can't lose my salvation. So it doesn't matter. No, don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. Don't get frustrated. when. Don't treat it too lightly and don't be weary. Don't take it too seriously. Like Don't get in despair because you're being disciplined. Don't think it doesn't matter and don't be in despair over it. Oh, no, he must not love me because he's disciplining me. Or, oh, no, I can't lose my salvation, so it doesn't really matter. The discipline's irrelevant. No, neither side. There's a middle ground here. Verse 6, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So when a believer sins, one of the things he does, as we saw in Ephesians 4, is he grieves the Holy Spirit, causes God to think or feel differently about us, grieves him, changes his mind uh, toward us, but not eternally, not to the point of affecting our salvation. Secondly, what it does, according to Hebrews 12, 6, is 
we are disciplined. When believers sin, believers are disciplined. One of the ways you can know whether or not you're a child of God or not is does God discipline you when you sin? Do you feel that conviction of the Lord when you sin? If you don't feel the conviction of the Lord, if you don't feel his chastise, His chastisement and his discipline, then you're not saved because he disciplines those whom he saves, which is one reason why if your sin doesn't bother you, you should be worried that you might not actually be a child of God because if God isn't disciplining you, that means he says you're not mine. When you show up, he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I wasn't disciplining you when you did wrong. I didn't care. It didn't grieve me, right? It didn't cause me to discipline you because you're not my child. So if you're a child of God, if you're saved and you sin, you will be chastised. You will be disciplined uh, by God because he disciplines those whom he loves. Okay. Uh, further down in this passage in verses 9 through 10, it says, it says, uh, it, it, he says, uh, let, let me back in verse 7 just because that, it illustrates what I just said. It says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. Like when you sin, he's going to treat you like a son if you're his son. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in verse 8 of Hebrews 12, if you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If God doesn't discipline you, you're not his child. You're lost. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we've respected them for it. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us, for a short time, earthly fathers, as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. There it is again. Same thing that Paul does in Ephesians 4 is the same thing the author of Hebrews does here. When he says, look, one thing that happens when a believer sins is it brings the discipline, the, chast the chastisement of God upon them to discipline, to correct Right, um, and and it and it and it not only is a mark of their salvation, but it is the thing that God uses to save them. In other words, He's molding you. The reason He disciplines you is because He's molding you into His likeness. He's 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 in His words um, that we may share in His holiness. He He is creating you to look more like him. And so that's why he's not going to let sin go unchecked. So what happens when a Christian sins? First in Ephesians 4, the spirit is grieved. God changes his mind about you, but not, not for forever, temporarily. It's a temporary change of mind because he's going to discipline you and bring you back to himself because he's going to mold you and make you into his holiness. And so he's going to work on you. He's going to fashion you and uh, bring you to where you should be ultimately when you are glorified uh, in the end. And then finally, one last thing that happens when believers sin. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. He's talking about a foundation that Paul is going to lay in his life by all the things that he does for the Lord. Uh, all of his actions. He's going to lay this foundation. It's going to be tested. And he says this in verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Righteous deeds built on Christ's foundation with your, your life, tested, yes, these are righteous deeds, you receive a reward. If anyone's work, though, in verse 15, is burned up, they're seen as unrighteous deeds, sin, it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test it. He says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, 
though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Here it is again. And I love how in each one of these passages that we're discussing, where God's unpacking what sin does in a believer's life, he always seems to end on the truth of eternal security, that you can't lose your salvation. We're not talking, but it's like every passage God is making clear, we're not talking about you losing your salvation because Romans 8, 1 is true. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. End of discussion. It's over. But if you sin, you will grieve the Holy Spirit. He will change his mind about you temporarily. Secondly, he will convict you. He will discipline you. He will chastise you to bring you, um, to, to mold you into his holiness, to, to change you, uh, to, to soften those sinful edges. And then finally, the, the third thing that sin does in a Christian's life is it causes you to lose heavenly rewards. So your work's going to be tested. There's a bunch of sin there. That's going to hurt your rewards and glory once you stand before him face to face. Um, but you're still going to be there, right? So if anyone's work is burned up, verse 15 of, of 1 Corinthians 3, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So the judgment's going to come. God's going to be disappointed in what you did. He's going to be disappointed in your sin. You won't receive the rewards that someone else receives, uh, but you yourself will be saved if you are truly a child of God, repentant of your sins, and have trusted in Him. In other words, we cannot fall from justification, but we can. As believers, we can fall from God's what I would call fatherly pleasure. We have a relationship with God. We are children of God, which means you and I are invited into one of the most glorious relationships, not one of, the most glorious relationship that exists, an intimate personal love relationship with the creator and sustainer of the universe. And God says, I love you unconditionally to the point that I will die for you and nothing you can do can take you out of my hand. But when you sin, it grieves me, it hurts me, it bothers me. And though I am your father, your sin, that your father that will never stop loving you, will never disown you, when you sin, it grieves me, it hurts me. And you can fall from a position of fatherly pleasure. And this is why Christians can be Christians, but not be blessed in their earthly physical lives. They're not blessed because they're living under the chastisement of the Lord because he's refining them because of sin in their life as opposed to them um, living under the full blessing of having fatherly, uh, a heavenly father pleasure uh, uh, placed upon them. All right, does that make sense? Um, I think it totally makes sense to me because as a father, I get it. I'm, I love my kids no matter what. Like there's literally nothing they could do to make me not love them. I love them no matter what. I will not ever disown them. I will not ever cast them out no matter what they do. They are my sons forever. But yeah, they grieve the mess out of me. Grieve me all the time. I'm so sick of being grieved by my sons. And there are many a day where they do not experience the fatherly pleasure that they could experience because I'm fit to be tied with them. I'm disappointed. I think differently about them. There are days when they behave in such a way that I look at my sons whom I love and I think differently about them because of their disrespect or because of their disobedience or because of their immaturity. And I think differently about them than I otherwise did the day before. But I don't ever come to the point of not loving them or casting them out or disowning them. I take them and I discipline them and I help them to see the error of their ways and hopefully mold them into more mature young men who love Jesus and are pursuing righteousness with their lives because that's a temporary, sin is a temporary thing for my kids and mine relationship that we can work past and get beyond because I'm committed to working past and getting beyond it because I, I love them and I'm not going to give up on them. So it makes sense to me that this is how it would also work with God and that's exactly how God describes it. So the danger here is that we as people can fall into this trap though 
that acknowledges, oh, sure, we know God's not happy with our sin, but we can get away with it. Like, at the end of the day, like, God's still going to love us. He's still going to forgive us, so we can just do whatever we want to do. And this is why unrepentant sin is a very dangerous thing that should not be ignored. If there is unrepentant sin in your life, you should be very, very concerned because a long-term pattern of increasing disobedience to Christ should be, hear me carefully, you've heard me say you can't lose your salvation, right? But a long-term pattern of increasingly um, not caring, not being repentant, increasing disobedience to Christ should be taken as evidence to doubt that a person is a Christian. If you aren't feeling the discipline of the Lord, if it doesn't bother you that he is grieved by your sin, you have reason to doubt whether or not you're a Christian. Not because you lost it, but because you never had it in the first place. We, we, I preached a sermon a couple weeks ago, and if you didn't hear the sermon, I encourage you to go back and listen to it a couple weeks ago on, on, um, on Matthew uh, chapter 7. I encourage you to go back and listen to it on, you know, when Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Um, this is that same principle here. I, I want to take you to another passage, 1 John 2, verse 4, as we talk about this. 1 John 2 is, 1 John is written that people would know whether or not they're saved. Like, I write this to you that you may know that you believe, that know that you have eternal life, you know. Um, but in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, uh, John says this. Whoever says, I know him, right? Whoever says, I'm a Christian, and I know him. We talked about the significance of that language back in that Matthew 7 uh, sermon that I, that I preached two weeks ago. We talked about the significance of that language. Whoever says, I know him, that means I love him. I am saved. Whoever says that, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Powerful thing. What is truth? Jesus is the truth. Jesus, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. And they, what he says there is if you claim you know me, but you don't do what I say, you're a liar and I am not in you. All right? So that is a powerful statement. Here's what I want to focus on. In that verse, verse 4, where it says, keeps, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. What is he saying? He is, because is he saying, whoever sins is not me, is not if, is not in, I'm not in them. Whoever, whoever sins, whoever does not keep my commandments perfectly is lost and is not saved. Is that what he's saying? No. And here's why I don't think that. That word keeps there. I know him. I'm, I'm working with my um, working with my Bible program here. That word keep, right? It is a present active. Excuse me. Present active participle. Okay. Present active participle. In other words, what it, what that literally means then. And I'm, I'm kind of doing this on the fly, so bear with me. Whoever does not currently keeping with usual probability, who's not, who doesn't have a life that is generally marked, right? Presently active, kind of ongoing with their life is a liar. In other words, what's your life marked by? Like, Typically, what are you doing? In other words, it's not about sinning a certain number of times, but it's about what's the trajectory of your life? Is the trajectory of your life toward Jesus or is the trajectory of your life away from Jesus? If the trajectory of your life is away from Jesus, is if the trajectory of your life is disobeying Jesus, then you're a liar if you say you're a Christian and the truth is not in you. He's not in you. But if the trajectory of your life is toward Jesus, following him, that when you say, I'm a believer, I'm, I, I know him, then your life is giving evidence to the fact that that's true. A life of religious duty and, and, and morality, though, should not be understood 
or misunderstood as confirmation of salvation. That's what we looked at in Matthew 7, 7.23, Matthew 7.23 and all that passage. They say, we did this for you, we did that for you. And Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So it's not like living a certain way and having all these good things guarantees that you're saved because doing good things doesn't get you into heaven. Knowing Jesus gets you into heaven. But what John is making the argument here is not that, but the inverse, which is if the trajectory of your life is away from Christ, disobedience to Christ, not caring that you're grieving him, not submitting to discipline under him, then that gives evidence to the fact that you don't have a relationship with him. The truth is not in you. He is not in you. And you don't know him. In other words, bottom line, what is the point? The point is this. What happens to a Christian when they sin is the Spirit of God is grieved, and that grieves the Christian. It means God disciplines us, and we accept that discipline. We even want that discipline. We are thankful for that discipline. It would bother us to not get that discipline. And then finally, the reality of losing our heavenly rewards bothers us. And you know why losing our heavenly rewards bothers us? Not because we're going to be poor in heaven. The idea of losing our heavenly rewards bothers us is because our heavenly rewards in Revelation is pictured as a, as a crown that Jesus is going to give us. Our rewards, here you go. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Here is a crown that is yours. Here are your rewards for all the good things you did for me on earth. And what does Revelation say we're going to do with that crown when we get the crown? We're going to cast it at his feet because they are ultimately his. And the idea that we would show up to heaven and have nothing to cast down at his feet because we wasted our lives living for ourselves is so gross to us that we would come before him in worship face to face with no offering to give him that it bothers us so much that we would we do repent of our sin daily and we turn to him and we trust in him daily and we're asking him daily to help us and 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 help us to flee from sin resisting the devil that he would flee from us we're praying for that because we want more than anything to show up to that heavenly worship service one day perfect and glorified with the biggest and best crown of thorns or crown of thorns uh, crown of rewards so that we can lay them and cast them at his feet and say here you go Jesus you deserve this my life that was given for you in service to you because your life was given as a ransom for mine so that's that's why sin matters like that's why sin matters in the believer's life it's about your future worship service and if you've got an offering to give one day and uh Believers, Christians, want to have an offering when they get to heaven. So, sin matters. We need to resist it. We need to flee from it. That's what happens when a Christian sins. All right, that wraps up our study on sin. I hope that was helpful to you. Um, we will continue uh, with moving on to a next uh, study when we move on from here. Uh, but hopefully that's been enjoyable. And hopefully uh, you were able to watch here uh, online. So, God bless you. And um, stay safe. Wash your hands. Um, and if you're able to come to church Sunday, I hope to see you then when you do. And if you're not able, um, I hope to be able to, um, to talk with you about uh, what's going on in your life in another capacity in another way. All right. God bless you.